Meyer holds biomechanics, a comprehensive system designed to utilize every movement that an actor might encounter. What this was was simply the study of mechanics as applied to human beings. Meyerhold approached it to, what, to the extent that he looked at the human body as a machine and the actor as a machinist. So in the first part of the, part of the tape, we're going to do a series of exercises which are Meyerhold's system for training actors. Now the kind of actors he were tra was training were workers, not people that are like in MFA programs or something, but people that had jobs all day long and only had a short time to learn how to act and to learn what they were going to do in the play. So he scientifically designed the most efficient series of exercises that he thought would teach people how to act. Now he approached acting from an outside kind of angle, a physiological angle, as opposed to inspirational angle, angle that Stanislavski used, which was, uh, as we all know, you feel something and then you do it. Meyerhold said you do something and then you feel it afterwards. For example, when one decides upon and follows through with the execution of a movement, then the individual will physically experience a reactionary impulse influencing all other body parts. And Meyerhold war, uh, worked with his actors to find that uh, from a sequence of physical positions and situations, there arises those points of excitation which are informed with some particular emotion. It's kind of like Pavlov's idea of behavior modification. You know the dogs that would hear the bell and they salivitate. Well, what happened is that you, you, uh, there is a chain of, of actions, and instead of in some kinds of inside acting, you feel something and then you do it out of that. Well, the chain of events is turned around, and you do something in a very strong way, and then you feel it, or you have some kind of reaction on the inside. So this set of exercises is designed to teach the actors to be sensitive to their bodies, basically. Sensitive to, to feeling what their body is doing and reacting. Again, Meyerhold concentrated with his actors to apply both Tayloristic principles of motion economy, simply watching the motion and using the least amount of motion necessary when one moves, and use James' emotion theory when he worked with his actors, which caused them to automatically experience an entire gamut of emotions, again, and it's due to a constantly changing arrangement of musculature, but with the least amount of physical tension. Tension, yes. Rigidity, yes. But not an over extent of it to where you can't connect emotion with physicalization. So, we've been working on these exercises for, well, we did, we did a lot of research all last semester on Meyerhold's theories, and some of us started doing the exercises last semester. But as a class, we've only been working on them a couple of months, a bit a day. And so we're not experts by any means. But uh, we're going to do our best to share with you what we've learned. And um, each etude, it's a little short kind of task has a, a, a title, and we'll give you the title and tell you um, so a little more about the principles of biomechanics and also the objective of the particular exercise. And then we'll do it for you. Then we'll come back and tell you another title and do those. And um, the first one is the dactyl, which is sort of the beginning. Uh, a signaling exercise. Yeah, the beginning exercise yeah. for almost everything. Every etude you'll see begins sort of with this dactyl thing. And also they end the particular etude with the dactyl. Not always, but for the most part that happens, both with beginning, initiation, and the end. So we'll start with most of the group doing the dactyl. A simple dactyl, which was what's us usually done in the, the exercises themselves, and also a full dactyl. Simple. The first full etude we'll be doing is shooting the bow. Meyerhold says, biomechanics doesn't tolerate anything accidental. Everything must be done consciously and with prior calculation. The objective of this particular etude is development of free broad shoulders and arm movements and use of horizontal extensions of the body for finding centers of gravity. Now the first time John goes through this, I'm going to read the instructions for the etude just so you can kind of get an idea of how complicated it is. And the second time, he'll just go through it on his own. The actor executes two dactyls. The actor falls to the floor. He draws his legs and arms together. Rising on his right foot, he slowly draws up an imaginary bow. The actor advances with his left shoulder forward and his right foot back. Spotting an imaginary target, he transfers his weight from his right foot to his left and back to the right foot. 
Describing an arc with its center at his right shoulder, the actor's balance is shifted from the right leg to the left and back again to the right. He draws an imaginary arrow from his belt or imaginary quiver. Very quickly, he bends his upper torso towards the floor. Now slowly, the actor straightens up, holding his extended arms in a rigid position. The left arm is drawn out toward the front. The right arm is thrown back at a slightly lower level. He slowly loads the imaginary bow and draws it back. The actor aims. He fires with a shout. His body immediately contorts like a sprung bow into positions of refusal. Return to position. Now John will show it in a regular speed. And I'll give you a clap to start. This etude is called Stab with the Dagger and Carrying the Sack. Now, in Mel Gordon's article, he had the etudes as one, a two, I'm sorry, two distinct etudes, whereas, as opposed to that, he stated that they are, in fact, one etude. Now, the objective and the principle of this specific etude is that each movement must have a strong basis. Each element of the task must have its own point of support. And the beginning and the end of the execution of every task must be distinctly accentuated. And in this particular etude, each participant, when sure of himself, must signal to his partner with the recoil, or by other means imperceptible to the spectator, his reactions to carry out the ne next task. The objectives of this particular etude are to establish coordination with one's partner, to continue development of strengthening lower trunk for center of balance, and for the development of reflex excitability from outside sound stimuli. The next etude is tripping up. The uh, purpose of this etude is development of rhythmic balance and extremely fast reflex excitability. Orientation in space in the presence of a large number of persons is an extremely important matter. And the task of each one is to find his separate way in the complex movement of the group. This next etude is referred to as dropping of the weight. And the objective is to practice pure linear, movement, linear movements and to learn to support weights and to fall. And now for something really exciting. Leap to the chest. This is a very difficult etude performed by John and Ray. Oh, John and Brian. Uh, Meyerhold says all art is built on self-limitation. Art is above all a struggle with the material. This etude was inspired by the um, Italian actor Grazio, who, um, when he did this etude, reportedly bit his partner on the neck and drew blood. We don't recommend that, but... <laughs> Um, the objective is exercise in precisely estimating distances, supporting weight against the chest cage through positioning of the legs. This 
next etude is the horse and rider. It's important to perform each exercise precisely, especially in the sense of parade, the use of stage platform, effect, and so forth. The objectives of this particular etude are strengthening shoulders to support weight and development of reflex excitability. The next exercise is the circle, and the objective is to uh, get used to supporting weight and coordinating with partners. This etude is called Leap from the Back. In this particular etude, an absolute economy is essential. All tasks must be fulfilled with a minimum number of devices with the utmost expediency. The objectives, the development of many forms of balance and reflex excitability, and developing and refining coordination with one's partner. The last etude is throwing the rock. Now we're going to do this in three separate sequences. The first time will be like the other things, just the regular exercise itself, the kind they used in the class. The second one is a variation, which Jacqueline developed herself. Now that's a step towards the pantomime, which she'll do thirdly. Uh, the pantomime was kind of like an improv that they used in class. They'd use the general etude, but they'd make it into a story. And the title of this story is Camping Out with the Bear. So, first you'll see the group, then Jacqueline by herself, and then the pantomime. Cut to.
The following scenes are rep representations of our understanding of Marhold's acting and directing techniques used in his 1922 production of Fernand Cromlink's The Magnanimous Cuckold. This production was one of Marhold's most successful and it was also a showcase for his recently de developed biomechanical exercise for actors. Since Marhold believed that the theater should be for and by the masses, he believed that any person trained completely and, and completely skilled in biomechanics could conceivably become an actor in his theater. Um, although this type of style of acting has a lot of aspects from commedia, uh, buffoonery, and acrobatics, uh, to call it unartistic would be uh, unjust to Meyerhold and the work they did. Um, the style of playing is not like psychological realism, but rather the psychology of each character is signaled to the audience through broad gestures. The job of the actor then is not to be on stage, but to demonstrate. Um, Marho believed this acting style was best suited to the new formed Russian masses and he also accused Stanislavski's actors of being nothing more than sensitive readers. Um, the emphasis of this theater then is not mimicking reality, but creating spectacle, art as art. Um, the play, the story of the play is about an Othello-type character who forces his wife, because of his overbearing love for her, to bear her breast to her cousin Petrus. He sees a light in his eye and slaps him and thinks that she is, and from that point on, he b begins to believe that she has been unfaithful to him, while actually she hasn't. And he goes through a series of uh, making her sleep with practically the whole village and, and everybody else's uncle, until the very end of the play when he's about to shoot the cowhand who Stella runs off with to save herself and the cowhand. In this scene, Stella, while waiting for Bruno, is visited by the cowhand. Oh, poor little singer, so lonely. He waits for his bath. Beat, beat your wings. Oh, beat my little golden heart like mine does when Bruno looks at me. Oh, do, do. Oh, do you know that Bruno will tell me about his dream and I will remember mine, for our dreams must be the same. Will my beloved come back soon? Could I live far from him one single day without dying? Come in. Good morning, sir. My name is Ludovico Ludovic Luis. It's a name. Oh, I come from Bergen County to have a letter written. Very well, sit down. Estrugo will soon be here. Estrugo, that's the scribe. Yes. He doesn't know how to write. It's Bruno who does. He writes love letters better. Oh, then you'll have to come back. My husband is in town. He won't return till about noon. In town already? He must have left at the crack of dawn. He left yesterday after us. He left you here? Yes. You slept alone? Alas, I slept and I forgot my dream. If I had known you were alone, I would have come. Why? To take you to the hill. Oh, no, it's too cold there. I would have warmed you again. Oh, no, I would not have wanted that. Yes, you would. I'm just as handsome as Bruno is, and I don't love you any less than he does. You love me? Really? Since when? Since Sunday. Sunday? That's not long ago. I live alone with my animals, and I think thoughts ripen fast. So you love me? And I love Bruno. You can't do anything about it. It's nobody's fault. No, you are not as handsome as Bruno is. I'm younger and stronger. Oh, Bruno is our age. Age, yes, age. But he knows too many things. How can one know everything without aging? I can't even write. That's why I'm here. Bruno will write the letter I want to give to you. The letter is for me, but Bruno is not going to write it. Yes, he will. No, no, I'll warn him. I'll give him a suckling pig. But why, now that I know you love me? I have to prove it. With words, with Bruno's words. Words belong to everyone. Then if he wouldn't write, you couldn't prove your love. I'm going to carry you to the hill, running without taking a second breath, and I'll still have wind enough to make you feel warm and cold. Oh. Yes, you are strong, but you couldn't do it. I am heavier than you think. Do you weigh as much as a pregnant sheep? Let me lift you. Oh, I'm afraid of you. Leave me alone. You are dirty. Wait, stop. Huh? I'll call. Go ahead and call. I'm going to carry you away. No. Yes. Stop. Oh. Put me. 
me down, you boar. No, miss. I'll tell Bruno. Go ahead and sing your little song. He and I will fight like goats, and the strongest will have you. Put me down. Kiss me. Oh. And now, to the hills. Oh, quickly, Romani. Help, help. I'll fight you. Help, brute ruffian. To the hills. Stella's cousin and Bruno's childhood friend returns after many years at sea. It's Petrus, Stella's cousin. I'm happy you're among us. Did you recognize the village? Looks smaller than before, but familiar. Humble and gay. And Stella. Oh. You see her. The little Estelle of our game, she grew tall, you know, and at the same time, she blossomed. You'll see her. Since then, my love has grown stronger and dearer. Am I boring you, Petrus? Oh, no. Oh. My love is like a child that grows in its mother's womb. I nourish it with my very soul. Tell me, can it last? Her soul. You'll see her. Stella, Stella, come quickly, Stella. Oh. oh, Petrus, it is you. Hello, Stella. Hello, Petrus. Kiss him. Oh, we were enemies. That was easier. Come, Stella. He hasn't changed much. His eyes, though, have become paler. That's because of the ocean. He still has a savage look. Where is your luggage? They'll bring it along shortly. Tell me, Petrus, did I lie? Stella is very beautiful. And nimble, and brisk, and light. Oh, Stella, curtsy, I beg of you. Yes, three steps towards the door. Now, come back. Oh. Turn around where you are. Why? Give me your hand. Tell me, Petrus, isn't she a marvelous ballerina? She balances on the wave like a boy. Oh, Petrus. If you knew, if I could only express myself. Stella, my nymph, my flower, show me your leg. Oh! But I beg of you, lift your skirt a little. I wouldn't dare. But Petrus is your cousin and my friend. I want him to see how beautiful you are. My nymph, my flower, lift your skirt, I beg of you. Ah! Oh. Admire it, Petrus. Admire it. It's the horn of plenty. See how lucky I am. Oh, Stella, my nymph. Up above the knee. Oh, oh Petrus, what do you say about that? <laughs> oh, my love. Your breast, your little breast like a swollen pearl. No! You love her too much. I love you both. Oh. Let him tell you whether he's seen a show more pleasing to the eye on his torrid beaches. Your little breast, your breast, so soft. Oh. 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 Did I exaggerate but one might? Did I lie? Oh. Tell me, Petrus. Speak, speak. But above all else, Look! My friend! Oh. 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 Petrus, do not get blown from oh. for God's sake! What is happening to us? Do not let us fight like animals! Stop! Anyone else I would have killed! 
That is all. We are cured. Bruno's suspicions of Stella's infidelity grow. Here, you she-devil! Here, you witch! Here, you frog! Woman, don't you hear? Stella! Here I am, my love. Why did you keep me waiting, you monster? I was calling you, you prostitute. Sit down. Stand up. Where is he? Why does your skirt spread out like a bell? Lift your skirt. <gasps> lower it, lower it. You have less decency than a skinned frog. Oh, my God, what a martyrdom. She doesn't give me a moment's rest. Oh, Bruno, if it's a crime to love you, then I deserve a terrible punishment. But if my death can appease you, let me die right now. Where did you go last night? Last night? I slept against you, my friend. Against me? To speak against me? To act against my interests? If you did sleep, what did you dream about? Oh, I had a strange dream. I dreamed I was wearing panties. Aha! Uh -huh. You had a nightgown on, a nightgown. You're lying. Last night you left the room in your nightgown. How could I? No. The keys are always under your pillow. Well, uh, uh, what does it matter? Couldn't you open the door without keys? No. You want to make me believe a lot. Oh, I swear to you that I stayed in bed until morning. And I swear that you climbed like a she-ape up to the round window. No, my friend. That you found a ladder waiting there. Oh, no. no. Through the orchard. Oh no! That you were mixed up with some husky lad in the shadow of the night. Oh no, no! And that I will wring your neck. No! Don't say no! Yes, my love. Oh, oh, she kills me. Yes, my love. And I am dead. Oh no! Bruno, come oh. to your senses. Oh my dear, can't you see that you're my only concern? Bruno. For pity's sake! Is it John, the son of Paul Louis the Cartwright? It is John! No, it is Hector the postman! It is Hector! No, he's too fat. Or is it Alan the fisherman? It is Alan! Funny fellow, he spits. Or the gentleman who talks to the well, lady the when he comes to the castle the on Sunday to shoot bows and arrows? None of them, none of them! She'll never confess! Oh, you'll have it your way! But for heaven's sake, don't hold back your dear fury! Kill me now! Good. Stand up. Do you really weep? Is this not a ruse to deceive me, to weaken me? Take off that mask. Take it off, I say, so I can read the seductive lie on your face. Oh, oh, what a marvel. How beautiful and sad your eyes are. Stella, forgive me. Please, Stella, stand up. Stand up or I'll throw myself on the ground, worthless as I am. Oh, you must have been hot under that mask. Let me at least wipe the dew from your forehead, my ill-beloved. <laughs> that mask is what inflames my fury. You're never going to wear it again. Strugo, I think, advised me to dress you up that way. Oh, be quiet, I beg of you. Everything of you is precious to me. Your jealousy, your harshness, as much as your sweetest ecstasy. Could I love you enough if I could not endure your whims? Strugo, oh. I'm going to chase him. Oh. Oh, Stelikins. Oh! <laughs> Stand up! Somebody knocked! Oh, not yet! Oh, let him wait. <laughs> Stand up! It's him! It's a Strugel! Put on your mask! You refuse? Oh, no, my love. I am ugly. Yes, that is a Strugel's work. No, oh, hurry! No, wait! really didn't go out last night? You were really crying a while ago? You weren't making fun of me. Go to your room. Bruno, mad with doubt, asks that Stella betray him so that he may be certain of her infidelity.
First of all, we will open the doors and the windows. And the shutters. Let any man who wants to admire you find you in your full splendor. The age of the shadow has passed. Light will come. My tenderly beloved is miraculously cured. Not yet. But you will cure me if it pleases you. Oh, but immediately. Listen carefully. I have aged greatly in three months. My color is dull. Bile chokes me. My intestine sleeps in terrible nightmares. If this uneasiness gnaws at me much longer, I'll soon die. Oh, don't speak like that. I'll cure you. Tell me the remedy. Listen carefully. I count your steps. I measure your size. I lock you up. But I cannot be sure that I lock up your thoughts at the same time. Stop. Listen to me. A husband, as clever as he may be, cannot discover the cunning of his wife as stupid as she may be. And my God, you are not devoid of bad spirits. So, I have given up keeping you with my treasure. Do you understand? I will fight this very doubt which oppresses me. I will destroy it this very day. Oh, God be praised! Yes, and the devil too! So, this is the remedy for my doubt. The absolute, immediate remedy. In order for me not to doubt your fidelity any longer, let me be certain of your infidelity. What? I must make sure of your infidelity. No! Stop! Stay where you are. So, this is how you will prove your unworthiness. Tonight, under my roof, you will betray me in my presence. Oh, my friend, what are you saying? Then you want me to die? Oh, no, no, never. But I can die. Kill me. Not with your secret. Afterwards, maybe. Oh. No! No, there is no other solution. I will know about my misfortune, and I will be the first to know. Have pity on me, my love. Remember how innocent I was when you first knew me. I didn't even know the words for things. I am still the same, for love bases sin. Exactly. I want you impure and dishonored. I will be a cuckold today, or I will die. The horns or the rope. Choose for me. I will not have the courage I need. Oh, Bruno, it is so ugly, another man. It is a joke, a trial, maybe. Choose for me, the horns or the rope. What will the other man do to me? Oh, Bruno, I'd rather lie and confess that that will please you. If anyone comes near me, I'll bite him. Oh, stop frightening me, please. Choose for me, Stella. Oh. Afterwards, you will be unable to look at me. And I, people will point their fingers at me. Oh, Bruno, I love you enough to die. It takes greater heroism to suffer a long time than to die a fast death. And to suffer also. You are not going to suffer that much, you sly one. Oh, yes, yes. Ah, 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 enough grimaces. Choose for me. Pity, have pity. Choose. I'll obey. Meyerhold and the constructivists were bound up in and swept along by the Russian Revolution. With the change in political direction came sweeping changes in values, both moral and artistic. One of these changes was to affect Meyerhold's theater and is evident in the scenic design for the magnificent Cuckold. This change was the switch from the spiritual outlook to the mechanical or rational outlook on life. Up to the time of the revolution, Russians had for the most part been absorbed with the orthodoxy of the church and a feudal respect for the power of the czar. With the freedom bought by the revolution, new avenues of expression opened up for the artists. The government encouraged this, seeing it as a way to negate the power of the church and to modernize the country. The passion for machinery and anything that had to, be, uh, had to do with mechanized grew as the logical antithesis to the earlier worship of the church. One of the groups of artists which formed to serve these ends were the constructivists, who sought to create industrial anti-art that had practicability as its sole criterion and condemned all that was merely depictive, decorative, or atmospheric. Meyerhold was drawn to the constructivists for two reasons. The first being that his theories of anti-naturalism matched theirs, and because he was without a theater and needed a portable setting. At his invitation in 1922, Lyubov Popova, a constructivist, joined the theater workshop and agreed to build a construction for the magnificent cuckold the scaled-down version which you see here. Despite the set's attempted austerity, it evoked inevitable associations with the windmill it was supposed to depict, suggesting balconies, bedrooms, flower shoots, and so forth. 
This problem was encountered by the constructivist in every effort they made in theater, due to the theater's allure depending on the imagination. It is important to note that this setting represents only one of Meyerhold's many experiments and that not all his productions employed these staging devices. While in the end the setting did not conform to the aesthetic of the constructivist, it proved a superb platform for the actors and did indeed create a working area. The original Meyerhold Popova set was wooden, built to be sturdy, cheap, and portable. For our purposes, a wooden set would be too heavy, too expensive, and too time-consuming to build. Our set, based on the original design, is of steel and plywood. We had several objects we hoped to achieve in this set, that it be sturdy, light, portable, cheap, fit certain actors, fit certain spaces, and fit in a pickup truck. The face of the platforms is welded one-inch square steel tubing. The rear and side braces are Dexion, a steel angle iron with pre-punched hole patterns which permit many easy bolting possibilities. The platforms are three-quarter inch plywood and the step unit is of three-quarter inch plywood construction. The ramp is Dexion reinforced plywood and the slide is Dexion reinforced plywood with a masonite surface to make it slicker. The revolving door is larger than the original to accommodate a tall actor, although we have tried to retain the original paint patterns. It also has a step and handles built into it so that actors can ride on the door as it revolves. The door is made of three-quarter inch square steel, square steel tubing welded together and has two pieces of two-inch angle iron welded into the frame for a step. There are two three-quarter inch steel rods welded into the center, top and bottom, and these are set into sleeve bearings so that the door will revolve smoothly, easily, and rapidly. The door is covered with quarter-inch plywood. The door jam frame is hinged on the top and bottom for ease in assembly and disassembly. Except for the welding in the door and the facing, the whole structure is bolted together. The wheels are cut from Hexel, a honeycomb type cardboard, and are set in a frame of two by six lumber. They are rotated by hand by an actor. We have modified the original set to omit a couple of larger wheels, some railings on the ramp, and some of the set. The original probably stretched almost 50 feet across the stage. We left off the stage right stair unit leading to the taller platform and did not include an additional structural side of the revolving door unit. Our set is still over 25 feet wide. Designed to be a machine for acting, the original allowed movement through, over, under, around, and between the set elements. We hope ours has been a useful, as useful to our actors and as responsive to their manipulation. I was responsible for the costumes used in this production. Our actors wear improvised costumes based upon Meyerhold's 1922 production of The Magnificent Cuckold. In Meyerhold's production, the men wore blue coveralls and black work shoes. The women wore skirt and blouse uniforms and black lace-up boots. Pom-poms, a cape, or eyeglasses might have been used as costume props, but the more practical things were, the better in Meyerhold's eyes. No makeup at all was used. Our budget, like Meyerhold's, was limited. Our actors make do with coveralls, skirts, and blouses taken from our own costume stock. These have been dyed a neutral gray to ensure unity. The practical work shoes of the 1920s have been replaced with the most practical shoe of our day, the tennis shoe. In this production, as in Meyerhold's, costumes were not designed so much as improvised to serve the ac acrobatic movement and stress simplicity with utilitarian functional outfits. 